Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Gleisner from the Library of Michigan introducing the 2021 Michigan Notable Books. Today we are here with Silke uh, Wynick and Stefan Szymanski talking about their book City of Champions. Uh, they are all about the history of sports in Detroit, a fascinating book. I can tell you right now the committee was sold on this book because it goes beyond what we would typically talk about the history of Detroit with the Red Wings and and the Pistons and the Tigers goes very far back, all the, the, the days of lacrosse uh, back in the uh, very, very uh, colonial times of the city of Detroit. And so with that, let me welcome Silke and Stefan. How are you today? Doing very well. Happy to be here. Great. Lovely to be with you. Lovely to be with you. And thank you for being here today. And so folks today, just like we did last year, we're going to be talking and asking several questions. And Stefan Silke, I would just uh, ask that you give us some background on yourselves. And how did you come to write this book? And whoever would like to go first. <laughs> That's a question. Who? <laughs> who goes might first? be easy if you just if you just pick four us who goes first. All right. So I'll go ladies first. So okay, how did you come? What is your background? How did you come to write this book? I'm a professor of German and comparative literature. And I, I came to Hanover in 1998 to work at the University of Michigan. And uh, it's really striking back then how few ties there were between Ann Arbor and Detroit. People would straight out tell you, oh, don't go to Detroit. Detroit is, you know, it's so dangerous. Don't ever go to Detroit. Maybe for a game or a concert, but come right back. And I have to say to my shame, I believed that for several years, right? Because what everybody in an hour told me. And so when I finally um, had the good fortune to be introduced to Detroit properly um, by a friend who had grown up there in the Armenian community and now uh, was connected all over town, I was just, I mean, it was kind of instant attachment. There's something about Detroit, despite all the, the troubles, right? Everything that's really difficult and not great. Sure. Um, that is also incredibly compelling. It is such a compelling city. And I think the more you spend time there and, and more different parts of Detroit, the more you realize how suffused it is with, with American history. We, we say in the book that it's possibly the most American city that um, so many iconic American events happened in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so this fascination, uh, it turned out I shared with Stefan. Uh, I was not very much into sports before I met Stefan. I still hate sports, um, but well, I don't hate them. I tolerate them. But the stories around sports are so fascinating. Sure. It's such a kind of core cultural practice, sports, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as we say, teams are kind of the only institutions now that represent a city as a city. So um, yeah, so if you wanted to write about the city um, and you wanna write about sports history and you wanna write about the history of race and urban planning, um, and the car and so on. Yeah, this this was this brought it all together for for me. Sorry, that was a, probably a longer answer than you wanted. No, absolutely yeah. fine. How about you, Stefan? What's your background? What get, brought you to write this book? So um, I have a slightly different trajectory from Zilka. So I moved to Michigan from London uh, ten years ago now. In fact. Um, I'm an economist by background, um, so I don't know anything about literature at all. Um, and I was, my research came to be all about sports um, many years ago. Uh, it was never a plan, but it happened. And uh, that's how I got asked to, to come to, to Michigan. And I'm also, I'm a Londoner by background. I, I lived in London pretty much all my life. And I love cities everywhere um, and London is a city that has beautiful parts and it has some pretty grim places as well and so um, what, coming to, to, to Ann Arbor I mean I was drawn to Detroit because it's just a big city and I just want to be in big cities and uh, the more I learned about it the more I was go, became fascinated by it and I think that but there is something specific that really got me going on this which is actually an article I so coming here as a 
as a foreigner, I wanted to learn a bit about the history of, 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 uh, of Detroit and Michigan in general. And so I uh, was uh, subscribed to Michigan history. And I found this amazing article in written in the early 2000s about Detroit's attempt to win the 1968 Olympics and the bid that they undertook in 1963. Um, and there was just a little footnote in this article saying that there was material in the Detroit Public Library, an archive of material behind the bid. And so as an academic, I thought, I have to see this archive. I have to go see it. And then... When I went to Detroit Public Library, I found they had 30 boxes of materials. And it was just not one bid in 1963 for the 68 games. It was actually a whole string of bids going back to uh, 19, the 1930s and this perpetual attempt to bring the games. And so I started reading about that. I went through the archive. I started teaching about it. And the more I, I read about it, the more I wanted to write about this history, which nobody, everybody seemed to have forgotten. Um, and uh, at an early stage, I actually proposed to a publisher writing a book about the Detroit Olympics. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the public, a publisher said, well, you know, that's sort of interesting, but it's a bit narrow. Could you maybe broaden it out to, you know, all of, Detroit and Detroit's history. And so that's in some ways the genesis of, of, of the project and thinking about putting this in, in the broader context of the city's history. Very nice. So for both of you being not from Michigan, not even from the United States originally, I mean, did you guys have any idea of the legacy of Detroit sports? I mean, were you aware of that before you came uh, to Michigan? That's a complete no for me, but that would be true <laughs> for any sports city in any country. Okay. Um, I mean, I barely know my German teams. Um, I didn't know about Detroit, of course. Detroit, the car, and so on. Um, yes. Sure. Okay. Okay. But the sports, no, none. Okay. Nothing. Yeah, and so as a as a, as an economist who writes about sports, I knew a lot about American sports in broad terms, particularly from an economic perspective. I'm thinking about how the business works, sure. how uh, revenues are generated, how the organization works, how it serves to deliver to serve the interests of those who who organize the sport. So. But that, that didn't mean I knew very much about Detroit sports because, right. you know, Detroit has a history, but so does New York has a history. Los Angeles had a history. Kansas City has a history. So in some sense, as an outsider, as a foreigner, I didn't really know very much in detail. I probably couldn't have told you very much. Um, and, and that's probably true about a lot of things about Detroit. Like Silka said, I mean, I knew it was everybody knows it's the city, the city where the car comes from. But. I actually, I'll be honest, I didn't know it literally was, you know, a few hundred yards across the river from Canada. Mm. And I didn't know that Canada was south of Detroit either, you know. So these sorts of details that you learn when you come here were, um, I have to say, completely unfamiliar to me. And again, part of the fascination in writing the book was learning of these things and thinking, this is much more amazing than I, you know, I knew it was important, but I didn't know it was quite this interesting. Um, sure. So... so you, you learn about the, the city, you learn about the Olympic attempts, and I've, I've read about the 63 attempt and how Detroit was really kind of, uh, kind of considered in a way of a, a backwater, and that's why it would never get, you know, the, the Olympics. I mean, that was one of the reasons that was posited in a, few, uh, a previous book. I'm just wondering, how did you guys, first of all, get the genesis of this book to go into a full-scale history? Because, I mean, Really, when my introduction, I talked about I mean, you both. I mean, like you go very far back into French colonial times, British colonial times, all the way to the present. I mean, like, what was that idea? When, when I don't want to say moment or conversations that you two had about the genesis of this book and saying, you know, we're going to do a comprehensive history or as much as you can, sports history on the city of Detroit. I, I, I'm fascinated by that. I think what happens is you you look at one story and then you look at another one and then you you know you start reading up on Malice in the Palace and then for me I um I got completely um compelled by the story of Joe Lewis um mm -hmm. the only the only athlete who gets two chapters uh in the book and then you just realize that 
it seems that all of the city's history, or not all, but so much of the city, city's history gets filtered through sports, but also vice versa, right? Um, sports, as Stefan likes to say, it's such a mirror of society, right? For, for mm. better and for worse. So um, it, it seemed you couldn't just tell one or two of the stories, right? An entire book on the Olympics, I'm sorry, Stefan, I think would be a little much. <laughs> Not fair, <laughs> but I no. I think also. I mean, what what was what's been really important to me about this project is the way of actually really um, selling this all to Zilka and sort of actually persuading <laughs> her that this really matters. So, like she says, she's not really very interested in sports, and I'm mean, obviously I I do like sports and I watch sports, so it's not sure. hard to get me interested in this. And so, for but to get Zilka interested, you have to go beyond that, and you have to say there's something more important. There's something about the reflection about who we are as a society and the way in which um, our everyday lives are woven into sports, and how in some ways. You know, sports are the are the most prominent record of how ordinary people reacted to events that were going on at the time. It's it you know uh, too too much of history is written as a sort of the great man theory and and right. everybody you know the, all the great figures. Whereas actually, how people in, interacted with history through their sports it tells you about you know the, the roots of the culture. And you know, one thing we say in the book is, I mean, in our view, you know, Detroit was pretty much the most important American city of the 20th century, which makes it pretty much the most important uh, uh, city in the world in the 20th century. And that's something that I think already people, I think if you'd said that 50 years ago, you wouldn't have had much of an argument about it. I think people would have accepted that as, a, as an argument. You might disagree, but people would say, yeah, obviously this is really important. And I think people are, sadly, I think people are starting to forget this. And I think the one thing we wanted to do was to try and bring this back to people and say, this city really, really mattered. It was not it was not a trivial place. This was, this was the center of the evolution of, of our lives in the 20th century. So as a mirror to greater society, like what story really stands out for each of you as a mirror to that contemporary society? I mean, like, like with Joe Lewis or, you know, the Tigers, whatever it might be. I mean, what, what stands out for you guys in this book, City of Champions, as, you know, being a very good mirror into what was going on in society at that time? I, I, I'll throw it out to you, Silky. I'll, I'll go, ladies. For sure. It, it's. I think it's a risky thing to ask me to talk about Joe Lewis because you might still be here five hours later. Um, I'll. I'll try to, to be concise. To me, Joe Lewis is a good example of how various strands come together. Right. He comes to Detroit as a kid because his stepfather heard about the wages Mr. Ford is paying, right? And uh, for all of uh, Ford's immense problematic history, I mean, foremost, uh, uh, anti-Semitism, of course, um, he did pay roughly the same wages to black workers as to white workers, even though the black workers had the tougher jobs, right? And um, the more dangerous ones and so on, but still that that was unusual. And there was a big draw, a big force in uh, the various waves of the great migration, right? From from the South to the North. So Joe Lewis was, was one of, um, one of um, that group, right? That came, in the um, in the early 30s to work for Ford, um, only of course to then see the Great Depression hit, and um, a lot of those those jobs uh, go away. But the, the family did okay. Um, he said, "There's a fascinating two piece autobiography that was published in Life magazine in 1948." He said he never knew racism before he moved to Detroit. Mm. Um, he said he, he's not saying that there was no racism in Alabama, right? He's not stupid. He obviously he knows, right? But he said he didn't experience it. But then coming to Detroit, which was then and is now America's most segregated city, mm. um, right? Um, he he got a very quick education. Then had this amazing career, right? Boxing was discovered early. Um, rose to um, to uh, heights of fame was the um, longest reigning heavyweight champion ever um, second black world champion um, after after Johnson um, 
then worked for the U.S. Army, right? As an ambassador, he was asked to bring in black soldiers who for good reasons, you know, many had had their doubts about whether it was a good idea to, to fight for America. He had the famous fight against Schmeling in 1938, which was um, sold as a fight between democracy and fascism, even though it's kind of a fight between two forms of white supremacy, right? The, the, between competing versions of that. So he was kind of this all American figure for a while. Um, unbelievably beloved by the black community, respected up to a point by the white community, right? Very, very central figure. Then after the war in 48, he kind of realizes he has to stop boxing, right? He's, 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 he's getting there, it's getting harder. And so, the plan he has, he wants to open a Ford dealership in Chicago with a friend of his who has a taxi business and, and knows, knows cars, right? Um, and what I found in the archives, and it's stuff I still think about every day, were letters by 32 Ford managers and dealers in response to Henry Ford II's query, should we let Joe Lewis have a car dealership? And it's a brutal read. It's all like, no, let's keep car dealing. Let's keep Ford a white man's business. Um, just hair raising stuff also gives you an insight into kind of corporate racism, right? The kind of middle brow, white collar racism of guys who sit in the office, right? And dictate these letters um, to their secretaries. Um, yeah, all 32. Well, one is one is in favor, but that's in some ways the worst letter. He said, yes, we should let Joe Lewis have a car dealership, but it should be in Harlem because we can use it to drive a wedge between the black and the Jewish community, right? Um, and so, of course, Joe Lewis never, never did get his car dealership. And if you think about what that man had done for his country, the prominence he had, um, the, the deep love he inspired and really a generation. If you look at oral histories, um, they will tell you that there was not a black household that didn't have a portrait of Joe Lewis hanging in their kitchen, right? Um, so he was a really big deal. He was also very, very engaged in a very quiet way in civil rights issues. Um, he spoke to Roosevelt directly. Um, he got clubs desegregated in England. He got Jackie Robinson onto a baseball team and so on and so on. And then you'd read these letters by these mediocrities, right? These car dealers, you go like, no, that would set a precedent. We can't do that. That would hurt Ford's image. And it just really hurts your heart. But you have these strands, you have these kind of complete Detroit stories. Joe Lewis is a deep Detroit story. Ford is a deep Detroit story. And they come together here and they show you how the South won the war in the North, um, which is um, fascinating and really, really upsetting. And so I'm, I'm, I'm writing a spin-off book on Joe Lewis and the Ford Motor Company, <laughs> a short one, I have decided, um, because there's so much material I couldn't get into the book. Look forward to reading it. Uh, I can't yeah. wait till it comes out. Stefan, how about you? What 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 size uh, book or what story really you know embodies that mirror uh, analogy for you know greater society? So, in the, the way the book works is there are thirty chapters. Each chapter is devoted to a specific event, and we around that event we tell the story of what Detroit was like at that time and what was sure. going on. Um, and so, and many of the stories are you know triumphs, winning titles, and things. Some 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 are quite funny, and uh, but I actually one I think to exemplify the sort of social side of things is actually somewhat sad story, especially from a hundred years ago this year, in fact. Um, uh, and uh, there, was a, there was a car accident in 1921 where a kid called Alphonse Kronk was run over by a car. Mm. And car, I mean, obviously a child being run over a car is a terrible tragedy that, that you know, it, 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 everybody can feel that, the, the, the horror of that. But bear in mind that in 1921, the car accident was a relatively new phenomenon, right? And, yeah. and you, you wouldn't have happened in many parts of the world because there still weren't that many cars. But of course in Detroit, 
there were lots. Um, and of course, the name of this kid, Alphonse Kronk, will ring a bell with anybody who knows about Detroit because the Kronk, it, the Kronk name is associated with an incredibly successful boxing gym mm. that developed in the 1970s and 80s with probably one of the greatest boxing trainers in history, Emmanuel Stewart. And a later chapter, we, a different chapter, we tell that story. But, the, but, they, but people are often wonder why is, this, why is this famous gym called the Kronk? And it's actually named for Alphonse, the kid who died, um, because as a result of that, his father was actually a politician in Detroit, a small local politician involved, involved in local, representing his local Polish community, it's a Polish name. And um, as a result of this, he uh, helped establish a, uh, the, the Kronk gym as a recreation facility because in the 1920s, that's, you know, there was a real shortage of things for kids to do. And people were starting to realize you needed to get the kids off the street and put them into recreational facilities. Um, uh, and there were a whole, uh, and there were a whole bunch of these being created in Detroit in the 1920s. Detroit, of course, you can imagine 1920s, Detroit was immensely rich, so that the city actually had quite substantial financial resources to invest in really the beautification city, because up until that time, you know, it had suddenly grown like Topsy, and with the car industry, and it needed some kind of, it needed recreational facilities. Um, and uh, the Brewster gym where Joe Lewis trained was another product of this investment in facilities for kids to be able to exercise. Um, and in some ways, the tragedy of Detroit actually goes back to this era because the investment program was picking up in the 1920s and there were a lot of plans to turn Detroit into a really, really beautiful city with open spaces, um, a transit metro system that would move people around. And if all of this had happened, um, many of the things that have happened since would not have come to pass. The city mm. would have remained, the, pop the, the population would not have moved away in the way that it did. And what put a stop to that was obviously the, the Great Depression. When the Great Depression hit, the finances, well, the city actually went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. I talk about the bankruptcy in uh, 2000 and uh, what was it, 2011. Um, but in fact, it's the bank, you know, the city was actually the first real bankruptcy of the city was in, in the 1930s as a result of um, the collapse of the car industry. And in some ways, that's the, the, you know, that tells you about Detroit's really biggest missed opportunity or one of its biggest missed opportunities. Fascinating. So I got to ask you both. So being an archivist by training and librarian, um, you've done some very deep research. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, high sports level stories. So I have to ask with both of you, um, and Sophie, I'll start with you. Uh, so you were definitely doing a lot of exploration in the Ford Mortar archives, is that correct? With the dealers and, and everything else? I, uh, I went to the Benson, yes. And I gotta say, um, I owe, the story about Ford and Joe Lewis to an archivist, and I will be forever grateful. Right. Um, I had been uh, researching Ford's PR strategy around athletes during World War II. They hired every famous athlete they could find, and they got themselves into the press over and over with that. Um, they had, for instance, Jesse Owens, who was um, head of Negro personnel at Ford. Really? for for a while but they also had they had just so many guys running around there um and they obviously after after um ford seniors support for the nazis um they they needed some good pr right and they got it in part um from these cutesy stories about athletes and the ford itself the the, the corporate ford archives were not particularly helpful Okay. Um, on any of this research I found, sadly. Okay. Um, but the Benson is great. And so I, I couldn't get that far. They didn't have much on Jesse Owens either. And I asked, well, you know, do you have anything on sports? 
that I might find interesting, writing this right. book about right. sports in Detroit. Right. And so um, <laughs> one of them writes back said, well, I have this folder about letters about Joe Lewis that's only been checked out once before by a high school student. And this was a Would like dealers? to look at that? This was <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> Was this of the auto dealers in this folder? The, the auto dealers that you were talking about? That was about the, so. It was in the um, it was in the estate of um, their general manager uh, Walker Williams. So he had he had spearheaded this um, collection of letters denying Joe Lewis the chance to sell Fords. Um, and yeah, so one of the folders in, in that estate was um, just those letters together with a note to Henry Ford II. And yeah, and so I would have not found this. I would have, I mean, I didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. I read a bunch of biographies of Joe Lewis and they mentioned this in passing. Oh, Lewis wanted a Ford dealership at some point, but came to nothing, um, you know, famous boxes, business ventures often don't, you know, work out. Yeah. Um, that, that's not unusual. But nobody had ever seen those letters. I mean, the archivists obviously have seen mm -hmm. these letters, right? But um, none of the biographers had ever seen those letters. And yeah, and I was just flabbergasted. Was, um, so I will be forever grateful um, to, okay. to the Stephen. archivists at the Benson for, for showing me that because it's it's just, yeah. No, it's I'm... like 48 in a nutshell. It's all about Truman, right? How scared yeah. they are that the civil rights legislation might actually succeed, that Truman might pull it off, right? Um, so, yeah. Very fascinating. Stefan, you are... The archives, in... yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you for that. We we do collect obscure things, that's for sure. Oh, thank important. you for doing this. No, I, and, and, and I... That I... work. I Which unfortunately, in all these, in any history book that I ever interview for, I always am fascinated in the research. And Stefan, you walked into a, a collection at the Burton Collection, I believe, probably at the Detroit Public Library with the 30 boxes. Uh, is that where you came across the Kronk story, uh, Alphonse Kronk? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, how was, I mean, it must have been just to see 30 boxes, and I've been in the Burton collection numerous times. I mean, it's a huge collection. It's the largest collection of Great Lakes history in the, in the country, if not the world. And I mean, did you just keep coming back? I mean, how did you find that Alphonse story? I, I'm sorry, and I, I, I'm sorry going on about that. So um, actually the, 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 the Alphonse Krog story was, was not found, uh, but it was not in that archive. Actually, the um, I mean, one thing I think for for us as re researchers, life has just become really, really easy. Uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, with digitization, um, yes, and Amazon, really. To be honest, I mean, I, I you can see behind me bookshelves. I've got several bookshelves of books on Detroit. I mean, there's not I, any pretty much anything that's ever been written. I've I've, I've acquired sure. from secondhand bookshops from, from which you can get online uh, or from you know directly from from you know the the current publishers so so that's one thing you can do that it's much easier to do that research and the second thing of course is newspapers digitization of newspapers is extraordinary and that's how i came across the the crop story was actually um the detroit free press which we leaned on a lot there's an amazing i mean amazing i mean that is the day-to-day -day history of detroit the newspapers right and yes. um newspapers.com is is really really uh, it's really really good for that can um, i add something to that Sure. So while we were writing the book, um, more and more archives of black newspapers came online. Mm -hmm. And that was also completely fascinating because, I mean, unsurprisingly, I suppose, you really get a different story. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Joe Lewis, um, the white press, by and large, presents Joe Lewis as a good guy, you know, very polite, plays by the rules, doesn't bother us can be champion as long as he keeps his head down. Um, the black press knows that Joe Lewis is friends with Paul Robeson, is organizing the benefit for Isaac Woodard, um, refuses to, um, to perform on segregated army camps and so on. None of this you will read in the white press, right? So it was really, really 
wonderful to have easier access to um, a broader range also of papers, right? I mean, we did work a lot with the Detroit News and the free kind of papers of record for the city, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was invaluable to also have those other sources. Well, so I mean, I think, Stefan. yeah. So I mean, I think I mean what's interesting is that the two, two, the two stories that that perhaps Zilke and I are most interested in, the the Joe Lewis story and the Detroit Olympic story. Those are the two stories in the books that really come out of work that hasn't been digitized. So in some sense, this is that's the most for 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 the real professional historian. That's the most truly original work in in the book. I think so. If, if you're being picky about it, um, a lot of the other stuff you could say, oh, it's secondary material. But this is really original archival research on both in both of these areas. Um, and on the Detroit Olympics, uh, I'm we are just about to to to, to launch a an online exhibition about the Detroit Olympic bids which is going to put much of this archival material online. And of course, that's the interesting, you know, as, as, as but this, the resp your responsibility as a scholar is not just to write about the stuff, but also to make sure other people have this material available to them and can do their right. own follow-up research in this area. And um, that's something that, that um, well, I think we both believe very strongly. Uh, and, um, uh, we're going to help uh, people sort of see this, see this material, and, and hopefully that will generate even more research going into the future. Um, one thing I want to mention about that is also, I mean, it's particularly interesting in relation to um, people still alive in Detroit for the 1963 um, in the bid for the 1968 games, which took place in 1963. Mm -hmm. um, they, the Detroit Free Press, organised a uh, a petition with the Detroit Olympic Committee and they generated signatures and all of these signatures are in a box in the archive. It's a big fat box of pieces of paper which has something like 10,000 individual signatures on it. At the Detroit I've had some, Library? In the, it's in the library, really? in the archive. Fantastic. And um, I've had as much as I can of that digitized and so that now we can draw maps and we can show you where people were who signed the petition for the Detroit Olympics, which tells you a little bit about the social structure sure. of who was interested and who wasn't interested and, and where awesome. support lay, lie, lay at the time. So I, that's, you know, this, this kind of thing that this sort of, uh, the, this sort of follow, again, another follow up project from, from this book. And um, Hopefully, we're going to make all of that available. To oh, me. and I was going to ask you about this, the socio class, uh, economic class of, of the people who are signing those petitions. So I think that's an amazing thing. I mean, that's a great GIS project right there. But also for people who live in Detroit, you can see which, you know, you can see where, which houses we, we you know, we've got the people put their house numbers yeah. down, people put their names down. So, you know, there are probably people still alive who signed this petition. And there, you know, you can trace also the movement, the social movement of people in, in Detroit. So where families are today compared to where they were when they signed the, the, the petition back in 63. So I think, they, you know, that's, that's I think. A, it's so just a, a follow up on that stuff. And where is that digital collection going to be? Is that with U of M then? Is that going to be uh, when that digital collection on the Olympics? Well, I'm just trying to figure out because I want to look at it one day. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the online exhibition is going to be up and running in time for the Tokyo Olympic Games. Oh, so that will be available. That's going to be an available resource. Um, but that's going to be more storytelling, and the, there will be some examples of the petition. But the full detail of the petition is something that I need to. Uh, right now, it's sitting on my computer, <laughs> and it needs to get off there into a public space where anybody can access it. And it's it's figuring out what that what the what the appropriate public space is um for, for it amazing so now the both Bentley you, wants it but well i would i would assume so and i think that's yeah. an amazing thing because so now to both of you you have all this research analog and digital and uh there obviously had to have been stories that you had to cut right i mean there, there had to have been things that you had to say okay this this has to be pushed aside and because we talk about the writing process in these interviews, and I, I don't want to keep you guys all day, but I would like to know, 
how did you decide what got included and what didn't get included into your book? Because again, I would assume only assumptions that basically you both, you know, there had to have been some sort of back and forth with the two of you uh, as to what got included, what didn't. And I'm just, just wondering a little bit into that process. I mean, we don't have to get down the, the nitty gritty, but I mean, just, you know, like maybe how, how did you decide? It was surprisingly harmonious. We we didn't <laughs> we didn't have fights about any of this. But I I, sh I should also I I, uh, I should say that Stefan had already mapped out a lot of the chapters when we oh, okay. uh, decided to do this together, and it made sense to me. I do have, or we both have, one regret in particular is that women are not very prominently represented in this book. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, right? We're talking about these iconic sports events and for most of history, women were just not seen um, as a legitimate part of um, iconic sports events, right? But if we had had more time or if I had had more time, I would have loved to write a chapter about um, um, the roller derby. Yes, thank you. See, I'm, my guilt has me blocked on this, <laughs> on roller derby, which is, is such a completely fascinating uh, sport and what's, um, and female sport, right, predominantly. Um, and what's, again, it's, it's such a, confluence of Detroit because the roller derby now takes place on the third floor of the Masonic temple. Right now? Yes. Well, not right today, but oh. these days. Okay. So you go into this grand old building, marble yep. everywhere, three-story columns, and go into a fabulous elevator. Um, you go three stories up. And there you are with the roller derby. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful. This kind of confluence of, of contemporary, very fun, very um, in the Masonic I mean, female it's... sport and this grand old yeah. building. I just completely love it. And uh, we just ran out of time. And, and mm -hmm. there was also a question of, oh, then you have like one chapter about women's sports becomes tokenish. Um, but yes, I hope somebody else is going to write the history of women's sports in Detroit because I'm sure there's a lot there. Well, and there's such a contrast there too, right? A female sport in the male fraternity hall. I mean, yeah. It's a grand hall. Yes. I mean, it's an all male fraternity. Exactly. Stefan, Silke talks about that you had it mapped out. How did you map it out? How did you have this all planned out? How What, what was the, the logic behind that? Well, I, so a very long time ago, I, read a book by William Dalrymple called The Jinns of Delhi or The Jinns of India, I okay. think it's called. And it's and I this book left a really big mark about it. It's a history, it's a it's a it's a sort of a, a, a sort of literary history of the city of Delhi in India. Wow. And what is striking about it is that it goes backwards. He starts from Delhi as it is today and he goes backwards and he uncovers layers of Indian history mm. and the Indian cultures. And of course, India is so fascinating because it is so multi-layered in the cultures that have gone through and left, but, but still with the Hindu roots still very firmly uh, embedded in, uh, the, uh, in, in, the, in the culture. So I, want, so I wanted to do a similar, use that similar idea for Detroit. I wanted to tell the history of Detroit, um, but not going uh, forwards in in the normal conventional way but actually thinking of it like archaeology thinking about starting at what you know because everybody comes to Detroit with a bunch of prejudices about things they know mm -hmm. things about bankruptcy things about crime all of this stuff that makes that that people just live with and it's sort of built into people's prejudices today and actually use that uh, sort of way, as a way to say well look let's uncover the let's go back step by step to see what built this history and also to think about things like turning points and where things could have gone differently and so the idea was to try and um, identify the, the 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 sporting events the, the 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 iconic sporting events that also were points in the history of the city that made that were, were very important so um 
obviously, you know, very, ob you know, there's obviously things like 1968 come up, but, you know, that, that those are obvious things, but uh, things like um, the, um, the, the race riot in 43 is, 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 you know, those are very big events in, in the history of the city, but also, you know, things about the early history of Ford Motor Company, um, the Ford uh, race in 1900, what the race he wins that enables him to raise the capital, enables him to build the company. Um, the, these, these sort of stories are, 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 very, are very clear. And so going back to your question about where, where so the, the problem is you want to have a fairly steady flow going back. And you want you don't want to have too long a gap, but you can't put in, you know, it can't be what, you know, every consecutive year. So the problem arose where there were periods where several things happened. I think the biggest one that probably people reading this book would be most Detroiters certainly would be most surprised about is we don't give a whole chapter to the 1984 World Series. Uh, which is, you know, was the, the 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 last and the fourth World Series win of, of the Tigers, sure. and um, again, Tigers fans will be really irritated by this and think that that's unfair. And in fact, what that's where we focus on. In fact, we focus on um, Tommy Hearns and the and the Cronk Gym in 1985, and so that didn't lead, we didn't want to put that next to it like that. So that that was one. I think another and another one that comes to mind, and there weren't many of these problems. Um, but the other one that comes to mind is really the treatment of the Great Depression. So around the turn of the, in the, the 1930s, you know, um, as, as Thomas uh, Sugru has pointed out in his very great book about the history of Detroit, one of the most important books ever written on the city, um, as he points out, you know, the, 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 what happened in Detroit in the 60s and 70s was all, you know, um, it all goes back to, to missteps going back to the 30s, 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, what was happening in Detroit in the 1930s was so important. And, you know, we could have probably spent a lot more time on the impact of the Great Depression. So um, those are the two that come to mind immediately. Okay. And so for both of you, what was the most surprising as you do the archaeological uncovering of the city? What was the most surprising thing that both of you found out about Detroit? So, okay. <laughs> I, I'm probably not allowed to say Joe Lewis again. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you want. It's your book. <laughs> I think uh, for me personally, what was most surprising was how engaged I got with many of these stories, um, mm -hmm. how interesting sports turned out to be after all. Mm. But um, another thing was we always knew that race would be an, an important part of the story of Detroit, right? And if you kind of, two white Europeans who kind of land in Michigan say, oh yeah, Detroit, right? We're gonna write a book about Detroit. There's, there's something uh, uncomfortable about that, right? And you, you have to approach that with really a, a, a great deal of humility, mm. I, I think. I mean, I do think sometimes outsiders can see things that insiders might be too close to, but that only goes so far, right? And so it turned out in the end, there's hardly any chapter where race does not play a role. Mm -hmm. And we knew that to be, that would be the case in the post-war era, right? When Detroit gradually becomes a black city. Um, but it was the case throughout Detroit's history, True. right? Um, and that, um, that's something I learned, right? And I, I, I would feel ashamed to say it's surprising, but it's definitely something um, I hadn't expected to happen with such intensity. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Stefan? So it's one thing to say that you're gonna tell the story of a city through its sporting events, but you do have to find the sporting events to actually tell the story, right? And when we started out, I wasn't completely confident that there would be enough sports, particularly going <laughs> back into the into the 19th century, to actually sustain this. And that was a really pleasant surprise that there's, and as you mentioned, you know, we could even go back to 1743, mm -hmm. uh, 1763, in, in, and find a sports event that is 
connected to the city of Detroit. And so um, that was a, a re- obviously a very pleasant surprise because otherwise it wouldn't be a book, right? I mean, that would, <laughs> wouldn't have happened. So, so, so that was a pleasant surprise. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you both. And, and, and just the, the final question of the day, being chosen as a Michigan Notable Book author, or award winner, what did it mean to each of you? I was so touched by that. Um, it's, I've lived in Michigan now since 1998, right? Mm-hmm. But to be recognized by your state and then by a library, we're people of the book, right? Um, we're, we're scholars, we love books, books are central to our lives. I found it really moving. It meant, it meant a ton to me. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Stefan? Yeah, I mean, when people say, where is your accent from? You know, I like to say the Upper Peninsula. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, I, it, it's just such an honor to be recognized by the state that you've adopted, you've been adopted by. I, I am, yeah, I'm just immensely proud and pleased and honored. It's just, it's just lovely. It's well, just and it's, lovely. it's a great book. And I can tell you right now, the committee you know, when we were deciding on this book, and I was definitely one of the voices, I said, it's about sports, and it's history, and it's Detroit, and it's not just the Tigers, and it's not just the Lions or the Red Wings, and quite frankly, we all agreed as a committee that this book must be chosen because of the history of sport in Detroit, Uh, and so we are all very grateful for what you wrote, and thank you for being here today, and thank you all for viewing it, and again, we're here with Silke Weinick and Stefan Szymanski, Uh, talking about their book, City of Champions, uh, 2021 Michigan Notable Book Award winner. And both of you, thank you so much for a lovely conversation. Thank you for being here today. This was such fun. Thank you. And thank you for your contribution to the literature of this state.